<laughs> good morning, good morning, and welcome to a rainy, cold, misty, overcast Juma Game Reserve in not so sunny South Africa. My name is Tristan, and on camera today I have a Fergus. There we go, there's the jolly thumb, no longer injured and recovered from its fall yesterday. So <laughs> that is all very good. Now, this is coming to you live from South Africa, which means that you can ask us questions or maybe even help us with a bit of insider info as to what maybe went past the dam. Remember, you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or YouTube chat. Now, the plan is for this morning, one is to try and stay dry. The second is to try and see if we can find some animals. Of course, that's the objective of this whole story. And so what we're going to do, I think, start is we're going to try and just head up to where the Birminghams were yesterday. Let's see if maybe all four are still around, or if at least one or two of them are around after that impala and buffalo and all the other things that they ate yesterday. And then from there, maybe we'll meander south once it gets a little lighter and see if we can't follow up on Tandy or Shadow, one of the two of them. So that's the plans for... The morning, whether or not we will be successful, well, remains to be seen. But that's the kind of objective and see how we go. Now, before we even get driving, I do need to apologize that every now and then you will see Fergus's hand. And not because he has got a twitch and just throws his hand in front of the camera. It's because it is raining and that means that we do get rain on the lens. And so every now and then he will be wiping the lens as we're driving along. So I do apologize in advance for all of that. Now, also, it is just me for the first half an hour, so it's always nice to hear from all of you, and we've got lots to discuss. I'm sure I'm sure many of you have had a good laugh at me over the last 24 hours, so it would be nice to hear lots of with comments you. and questions. Uh, you're also with me. Thank you, Ferg. With you. Oh, with you, yes. We also, we also laughed together. We did. Well done, Ferg. So it's always nice to hear from all of you, so comments and questions would be welcome for the first half an hour as we negotiate this area by ourselves. Right, Fergus, that's all done. Are you, TV, man. Well, we're going to go make good TV, fair enough. How's your coffee, Fergus? I see coffee's being poured in the back here. Yeah? There's a little mug of uh, fresh cheers, fresh everybody. coffee, and Fergus telling everyone cheers. Now, before we get going, I need to just do a turn, because I want to go have where to access, but Eggsy, our editor, is going on holiday. So let's, uh, let's see Eggsy. He's waving at us. So there we go. Thanks to Eggsy. Let's not blind him with my lights. Bye, Eggsy. So that's Eggsy going on a little vacation. He's heading out to go and enjoy a Christmas away. So there he is. He's in his little silver cart. There's a hand of Eggsy, and off he goes. So hopefully you'll have a wonderful trip and drive safely. It's not very nice weather, Eggsy, so drive nicely because otherwise you're going to have a, you know, we don't want you to have an accident like I did yesterday. <laughs> don't fall out your car. That's the only piece of advice I can give you. Not only is it embarrassing, but it might hurt you as well. Well. David, you're wondering if we'd ever have a celebrity guest on Safari Live. What do you mean, David? Are we not celebrities? No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, I don't know, actually. I, I suppose it's possible, but... Scarlett Johansson. Scarlett Johansson, that would be the only celebrity, yes. If Scarlett Johansson came and um, James could not put her on camera, I think we might have a fight on our hands. So Scarlett Johansson would most certainly be the celebrity. But I don't know, maybe. I mean, if there were celebrities around, who knows? It potentially could happen. I've always thought it would be good to have somebody like... Ellen DeGeneres or something like that that's part of a talk show and it would be highly entertaining do you not think to have her on and having a chat her and James I think would be a very witty combination and would be highly entertaining I would I would watch that I think um, and or maybe somebody else I don't know who else should we think about maybe hashtag Safari Live what celebrities you think would be fun because we want fun we don't want serious all the time we want fun and we want entertainment and we want to be happy about our celebrity so what celebrity do you all think should join us this morning I or any day actually not this morning because I think most people would opt out of rainy horrible conditions like we have this morning but in terms of any drive which celebrity would you like to see on Safari Live I think it would be quite fun <laughs> Safari Dream. I actually quite like your idea. You say you think it would be fun to get Mr. Wallington Graham on here for a drive to ask a few questions. I think it would be quite nice. Whether or not it would ever happen, I'm not quite sure, but it would be quite something to have him around. So maybe we should ask and see. So for those of you who don't know who Graham is, Graham Wellington is our master-in-chief, our director. He, he 
he basically tells us where to go and what to do and how to do it and has come up with the idea that is Safari Live. So if you're watching this and you're enjoying it, he is the one to really thank for this. Well, him and Emily as well and Peter because Peter's done all the tech side of things. But Graham is kind of the thinker and he is the dreamer when it comes to our product and really kind of gets us into all these amazing places that we go to. And I think there's quite a few interesting things that are happening and will be coming to you guys hopefully in some stage. So if anything, Graham's anything to go by, I'm pretty sure that we'll be across the entire globe and broadcasting every minute of the day. So we'll see how that all plays out, but it should hopefully go that way. At least it's it's kind of, we're heading in that general direction these days. He's the Elon Musk of the Safari world. You're right, Fergus. There's a good way to put it. So for those of you who didn't really know who Graham was, he is the Elon Musk of the Safari world. There we go. Graham Elon Musk Wallington. This has a good ring to it, don't you think, Fergus? Exactly. Mars, Live. Mars Live, here we go. Well, are you going to go to Mars Live, Fergus? Are you putting your hand up for that? Yeah, but I need someone needs to do the droning. Somebody needs to do the, the droning and the, and the rovering on yeah, Mars. There we go, so Fergus going to be the Mars pilot. Enjoy that, Fergus. I'll see you in 30 odd years then. Right. Let's get down to some more serious stuff while you all think about our celebrity that should join us. I'm going to go up Gallagher's shortcuts as you can maybe see because I didn't want to drive behind Eggsy. I feel like our lights behind him might have pressurized him. Also, we do look a bit like a UFO and so it's a bit intimidating when you come behind a car and you just drive behind them very stalkerish. It's not very good at all. So we're going to try and not do that to poor Eggsy. It is early in the morning and he's just waking up and no one needs that kind of pressure to start the day. So we've decided to come up Gallagher Shortcuts. I also jump onto the Biffles Oak boundary and try and then head a little bit further west. Ah, oh, that's... That's very sad. I'm, I'm a bit disappointed in that. Poor Morning Glory. She sat up all night on the damn cam watching, hoping for something to come along. And she says, not a lion or a leopard, not even a call. And that's not good. And Morning Glory, I want to know, not even one of the hyenas. Did none of them arrive either. I would have thought one of them might have come past. But that's very sad if nothing did come past. I'm sorry about that. It's always, it's, it's horrible when you sit and you watch something and you hope for something and nothing really arrives. That's the worst thing. But don't worry, Morning Glory such as nature and hopefully we'll have a rollicking drive like we did yesterday morning and maybe tonight you'll get something epic on the dam cam I do hope so and I hope that you will get whatever you want to see on the dam cam tonight for your patience and perseverance so Kathy you say Jane Goodhall I like that one. I, I think that would be very interesting, particularly if we were to do Gorilla Live. I think it would be an interesting kind of sort of situation to talk to her and I certainly would love to just pick her brain on certain things. So I think that would be a very, very cool one. Um, now, I'm not sure though we would have... Uh, maybe she's a fun person. I feel like maybe her and Taylor together might be quite fun. What do you think? I think Taylor would go well with that one. Or Jamie actually, the two of... She would be able to explain a lot of Brent and my behavior, yes, for sure, Fergus, you're right. As, or a lot of us presenters' behavior, we're all a little bit on the other side of things, so who knows, <laughs> maybe she would be able to decode why we fall out of cars and face plant in the mud. Certainly I would like to know why I did that and why what I can do to prevent it other than putting on a door because well I actually don't really like the door, so I'm quite glad we don't have one and who knows, maybe the door would have hurt me more than the ground. Not really sure, actually. So we'll try and kind of think of that. Now, Nikki, I know you mentioned somebody said Jimmy Fallon, who I think is a fine idea. We'll definitely get... Jimmy Fallon would be fun because... Christy, that's right. Christy, you said Jimmy Fallon. Ah, there goes a lesser spotted eagle. So let's see if it's going to land for us. There it did. It landed in the tree. It's going to be very dark, I'm afraid. To the right, Fergus. There it is, just in the middle of your frame. You can just see it flapping its wings. So the reason why it's a lesser spotted eagle is it had a big white band above the base of the tail between the sort of back and the tail and that is a diagnostic 
sign of a lesser spotted eagle so very nice to see of course now it just looks like a marula with feathers because you can't really see its head or anything else and hopefully it will pop out you can also see that it is very dark still this morning and so that's why this bird of prey is still probably quite low down and it's just flying from tree to tree also those feathers would probably be quite wet at this stage given that they are a little bit sort of it's been greasy and wet most of the morning and that kind of wetness kind of creeps into the feathers and I'm sure it's not very comfortable so it'll be a bit soggy and waiting for those feathers to dry before it starts to go off and hunt various termites and red-billed quellias and other types of insects and small rodents that they hunt right back to our Jimmy Fallon story I, I think it would be quite nice because Jimmy Fallon is very prone to doing lip-sync battles, um, toy band, and well we have a, a few aspiring musicians amongst our ranks. We've got Craig on the ukulele, we've got Fergus on guitar, yes Fergus? Yes, Fergus on guitar, James on guitar, I'm sure we could rope somebody in to play drums and so maybe we can set up our own little toy band and Jimmy Fallon can come sing one of his songs with James they can sing Was A Friday or they can, I don't know, one of James's hits that he's got because James is a, well, a very very well known musician in South African circles for those of you that don't know he's actually, some say he's the next Eric Clapton but he's just too, too shy to admit what goes on so you know he doesn't really let everybody know about it but I can tell you that James Henry is, is, can strum a guitar and exactly, Fergus. You agree with me, don't you? And 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 Craig also on his little ukulele. It, it could be the next Jack Johnson. It's 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 hard to say whether or not these two will make it. If Safari Live is not the desired passion, but we'll just have to see, and we'll have to try and wait and have a little look and and see how this all plays out. Right. Enough about music and Jimmy Fallon and James and Craig. Let's try and head and focus a little bit on what I'm actually supposed to be doing, which is trying to find the Birmingham males. We are heading down towards where they are. The likelihood of them being there is probably very, very slim. I don't think that they will. I was just banking on that maybe one or two of them stayed behind, given that they were so full yesterday that maybe they just didn't want to move. I think Nena and maybe Mfumo, who was further south and, and down towards where Tandi had that kill. I think those two will probably move a little bit more than what maybe you'd see from Insuku and Tinyo. Ah, Michael, you said, can we go to Galago Shortcut Hyena Den at some point? We can. We should have gone now. We've just driven past there, actually. But we'll go back there just now. I mean, it depends on what goes on here. Uh, what has gone on here? That's um, just parlors that have been running ourselves and an no yeah, so hopefully we are back and hopefully everything is okay. Now, we have found our first animal of the morning, which is exciting. It is a group of impalas that are looking rather sorry for themselves. They are damp, wet, probably petrified from the conditions that blew in last night. When it is windy and overcast and rainy, it is never nice to be an impala. I would imagine most of the predators were hunting last night, so shadow... Tandi, Tingana, all the lions, they would have been loving the conditions that came about the last evening. And so these poor guys must have had a rough night of it. The thing is, is that they're at least on this fire break section, which means that it's quite open here and they would have been able to see what was coming. Well, hopefully see what was coming, because otherwise, well, they're probably not going to be with us this morning. But you can see that one is just chewing a little bit of vegetation that is coming up through the long grass. So there's some dry grass there and then there's new grass that is coming up at the bottom. And so they'll be loving that new growth. At least the rain brings about nutrition and spruces everything up every time it does. Also, they'll be gaining vital moisture from the grass itself. I've seen leopards dr sort of licking grass and drinking basically off the grass itself. And so you'll find with these guys, they'll also sometimes acquire their moisture content from 
the grass when they're eating but you can see that that is still a pregnant impala which is interesting it's uh, most of them should have been born by now but there will be one or two late ones you'll find that some of them do get born around january so that one's still got a little while to go it's not completely full yet just yet and so i would say maybe another week or two until that one gives birth so there's still an outside chance that we can get a live impala birth on camera i've been trying all summer but they've been evading me and not helping with that process So Leslie, you say the water drops on the grass are beautiful. They are. It would be nice if we just got a bit of shimmering gold sunlight as the sun rose underneath the clouds because that would just make these all sparkle like little gems in the grass. But unfortunately we don't have that option, but it's still very pretty just to see all those droplets and Fergus is doing a fine job given that there's hardly any light to work with to be able to bring out all of those beautiful little drops of grass in amongst the impala's feet and around their head. So very pretty seed indeed and the impalas add to that. They are a beautiful animal. I always like seeing impalas, even when they are a bit damp and wet and kind of feeling a little sorry for themselves. Although that female looks as though she's okay. Right. Let's carry on, Fergus. Let's just head slowly down towards Sydney's dam and see maybe these lions are lying somewhere in the same area as they were last night. The nice thing about where they were also is that water-wise, Sydney's Dam is right there, which means that they can go and drink and then just go and lie down. So they don't actually have to move too far unless they heard females or smelled females or those buffalo potentially came back. Who knows? There's lots of obviously variables in this whole thing. And so we're going to try and just check. What amazes me about the Birminghams yesterday is that they abandoned a buffalo which I have no idea how much of the buffalo was left, but they abandoned the buffalo just to go and sit on a impala carcass that three of them couldn't really actually share, and each one kind of had to just sit there and watch the other one feed, and yet there was an impala, I mean a buffalo carcass that the vultures and the hyenas apparently just ate and tucked into, so very strange. I would have thought one of them would have gone back there and just gone and fed off that and been happy and content with not having to fight his brothers for the remaining impala carcass that was left by that leopard. Okay, Fergus, be on the lookout. This open area here is where these lions do like to lie sometimes. They sometimes like to lie kind of just in this clearing on sandy patch. Well, there's a couple of impalas around, so that's not going to work. Maybe our lions have moved off. I would imagine that they might not be around. It's, like I say, a long shot that we are trying here. And there's no tracks that I've seen either coming onto the cut line and moving sort of eastwards, which I was hoping maybe we'd pick up something like that. But let's just check the actual open area. And I apologize if there's any breakup in our picture. I know that where we are now, sometimes we do get a little kind of breaking up and a little bit of sort of audio issues. Right. Now it's good when you come here just to scan around and just to have a little look and see what's actually around Sydney's dam. I think there's very little at this stage. I want to try and get my binoculars out and have a little look and see. So, starlight, you're wondering about pregnant antelope, whether they are slower and it's harder for them to escape predation, most definitely. So the predators will target pregnant animals for the simple reason that it's just easier to hunt them. And they are slower and they're heavier and it makes it harder to escape a fleet-footed predator. It's also means that it's extra nutrition so for a predator if, she, if it grabs a pregnant individual well then it might just be able to secure a little bit more of its meal which i know sounds really horrible but it is true and, and it is the way it goes so and a double jelly baby, double jelly baby you, fergus you can't compare the two i don't think although maybe i i suppose in a predator world it is like getting the double jelly baby what is interesting is that there are still vultures around here from last night's kill. So maybe the lions are still around. I would have thought the vultures maybe would have come down if there was something to feed on. Although we know that that carcass wasn't very big. But the vultures are off to our left hand side. And I'm not sure Ferg's going to be able to get it because of the roof. But please excuse the pole as we go past. And so in that tree over there, you can see a it looks like a hooded vulture that is just sitting and waiting and bite. No, sorry, it isn't a white-backed vulture. Sorry about that. I thought it had a much narrower head when it was turned away. But there are a couple of them around, so maybe the lions are still 
lounging down at the bottom. So let's try and go and investigate quickly and see what we can get. Remember that it is probably going to break up a little bit. Don't go anywhere, but stay with us. Anna Marie, you're wondering if any reports of the wild dog pack this morning. So Anna Marie, no, from the simple reason that it's just me out at the moment. There's not a single other soul that is driving on this side, so not sure where the wild dogs ended up and where we can even start with them, but we'll try and find them somewhere as well. There's lots to do this morning and lots of things to follow up on. I think though that those dogs, all likelihood, are probably already off our area and have probably already gone um, out, but let's just double check and make sure. They were apparently were somewhere around quarantine at one point, so I want to try and just check around that side. Check here at Sydney's Dam, no nothing, no tracks for lions going over just yet. Now let's go to where they actually were yesterday because they were lying on the carcass down below here. And so maybe they're in that area. You would think seeing three big male lions tracks would be easy, but when you've had a bit of rain like we've had this morning, everything gets a little bit more compacted, and it's actually quite difficult to see tracks. I've also got no light to work with whatsoever, so there's no shadow on the track, which is often how we spot it, is that contrasting of light and shade gives us a chance to see. Now, nothing going that way. Interesting. Come on, Birmingham's. Be lying here. Let's see if they are going to be. I don't think they are. There's little dikers prancing around. Impala's not far away. Let's see. Here we go. No, it doesn't look like any lines are here just yet, but of course I could be wrong. No, so all three of them are gone. Vultures are on the ground feeding at the moment, which means that our lines have moved off. And I see their tracks are going that way, but there's a hyena. That's good news. So let's see if the hyenas are going to come in. I'm sure they will. They've spotted vultures and they've decided that there must be a meal here. So they're going to come in and try and see if they can scavenge. But you see there's a little bit of hesitancy first. So the hyena just comes, stops, looks. Okay, is there not a lion somewhere here that I need to worry about? As soon as it makes sure there's no lions, it will then start to come down and investigate what's going on and hopefully then chase these vultures off whatever's left. I don't think there can be much left given that three male lions were here. I'm pretty sure all it is is horns and a bit of a skeleton but nice to see a hyena. You see it's worked out okay. Not much is going on. It's got quite a nice full belly. Maybe it was on the buffalo that those lions left yesterday and, and fed off that but here it comes trotting in as they do. Angela, you're wondering if it is the wet season, given that we've got overcast, rainy conditions? Yes, Angela, it is the wet season. Um, now, in this time of the year, we do get a bit of rain. We have summer rains basically here, so we normally have sort of two sections of rain. One in October, November, and then again in January, February. But it, this year has been a little different. We've had mostly this soft, kind of overcast frontal rain. We haven't had the big thunderstorms that we normally get. And so we haven't really had enough rain at all. So we're hoping that in January, February, we're going to get far more rain and hopefully that will work it all out. Now our hyenas should come theoretically through this gap. Shooting off right in the background up, up into the bushes. So Ferg says he saw it shooting off into the background. I wonder if maybe, I don't know. Interesting. Let's try go forward a bit and just see. I thought it might come down to where we are but it doesn't seem to be the case. Let's have a look here. Maybe it's just being circumspect given that they are, well, the scent of lions is all over this area. I suppose that would be a clever thing to do if you're a hyena. Where did you go? Nope, the hyena has disappeared on us. It's gone deep into that thicket. Now, this was difficult to negotiate yesterday trying to follow that mystery leopard. But with the roof on, I think it's going to be even worse to try and do so. So I'm not going to beat around on a hyena trying to find that. There's also impalas over there. Let's just try and see where these lion tracks go. Maybe they head south down via teleaccess. I don't think so, though. I have a, a sneaky suspicion that they've gone north into 
towards Biffle's Hook, and if they're not at Sydney's Dam, then the chances of us seeing them is probably going to be very slim. But let's just double check again. I'm very impressed with Rusty this morning. Well done, Rusty. Rusty has got a signal where normally we don't have signal, which is quite amazing. Touchwood, of course. Bobby, you wondering about Inkahuma Pride and any word on them? Nothing. I haven't heard an update on the Inkahuma Pride in over a week, and I have no idea actually where the Inkahuma Pride is or what they've been up to. So uh, it would be nice to try and find out where they are. So you can the tracks for these lines are here on our left-hand side, just going, like I say, to a sort of east westerly direction. So just on that left tire track going up, they're very difficult to make out, but they are there. I can promise you that they are lion tracks in that area you can see where i swerved but there is sort of it's, it's almost impossible actually with the light that we've got at the moment but they are moving in that direction and so we will try and follow them and see if we can just work out exactly where they are you can see another set going up here on the right hand side There's tracks for lots of hyenas going up and down here as well so seems as though it was a busy little section last night Cheese, are you wondering when the hyenas will make their laughing sound? Well, generally it's when they're excited. So, let's say if they found themselves a carcass and many of them are together, then you'll find that they will kind of cackle at each other and, and try and sort of make a lot of noise and there'll be lots of laughing that goes on in that situation. Otherwise, they generally are doing a whooping sound if they are vocalizing for territory. Um, so, the cackling is only when they're excited. So, if they're fighting with other clans, if they're feeding, those kind of things will cause cackling hyenas to make a lot of noise. So our lions look like they've gone north. They definitely haven't come west, definitely didn't go east, and so they must have gone just straight north into Buffel's Hook, which is a bit sad, to be honest. I'm just double-checking here, though. Wait, hang on, what's this now? Ah, here we go. So they came this way. It looks like they've come here now during the rain or after the rain because the soil is quite compressed where they've walked so let's just double check looks like they've walked right here I think they've crossed into Simambili unfortunately but their tracks are after the rain because the, the tracks are big and, and sort of dark and the fact that we're not seeing them means that they probably have already gone over here we go you can see their tracks are going straight towards Simambili looks like for just two though it doesn't look like Three. Let's see, where did you go? There we go, you can see they've just gone straight across here. So there are their tracks, and they are fresh, these tracks. I mean, these tracks are probably from, I would say, maybe an hour or two ago. You can see the soil is darker where they've stepped, which is from them actually walking during the rain. But there's definitely two of them that I can see. I don't see three, but two is definite in terms of how many there are. There might be a third one that's crossed somewhere else. But that's where our Birmingham's have gone, straight down the fire break, as they like to do. So I'm pretty sure the guys on that side are going to be quite happy that they've got some male lions that they can see this morning. So, Christy, you're wondering, since the lions have moved away, how many leopards are known to be in the area at the moment? Christy, now it's obviously a difficult thing because of the amount of movement and, and, and the way that leopards move around. It's difficult to know exactly how many leopards at any one time. But on average, if we look at what leopards we're seeing, I think it's about 14 at the moment is, is the number of, of leopards that we see in this particular area. So we have in the male department, we've got Mvula, Tingana, Quarantine, Tamba, Hosanna, this new unknown male, so that's the six of them. Then, am I missing any males? Kojima as well, that's seven. Um, so those are the males that are around, so the seven males, and then you've got Tandi, Kuchava, Inkanyeni, not so much anymore now that we're not on Cheetah Plains, um, but you've got Inkanyeni, you've got um, Shadow, we've got, who else am I missing? Ingrid Dam, young female, has made an appearance in Chile, uh, Shadow's Cub, Tandi's Cub, 
So I suppose we weigh more actually, we're almost on 16 now with all of those and so I might be missing a couple as well but that's pretty much the sum total of the leopards that we're seeing in this area. Of course Shungile is still kind of, no one really knows what's happened there and I suppose there is a, a remote possibility that she shows up and, and surprises us all but I don't think that that's going to be the case. If she hasn't shown up in all of these months then I doubt that we have a situation where she's just going to randomly arrive now but you never know, you can always hope and it's always good to hold out hope when you concerning these kind of things let's see now lion tracks no I'm also just checking in case these lions came back the Birmingham's are known to walk a lot and they might just sort of turn and come back in this direction so always good just to double check as we're going along but those are that's the number of leopards so it's between 14 and 16 if we take the two cubs out shadows cub and and tandy's cub then we've got 14 of them that are hanging around at the moment which is a lot it's it's a very high density for the area that we're in i mean we're talking about just over you know 2000 acres which is not very much at all and so to have that many leopards is really quite phenomenal so we we spoiled that we do have a nice high density where we are and that's one of the reasons why we are in the sabi sands is because the leopards are probably better than most areas they're relaxed they're viewable um, and that coupled with the interactions that they have with lions and wild dogs and hyenas and all the other things makes for very compelling viewing Plus, why would you not want to see a lot of leopards? Leopards are the best animals in the world, so you would want to see them all the time. Well, I suppose we should turn our attention to leopard figures. What do you think? Yeah, let's find leopard. I think so, because we, well, we don't have a choice, exactly, Nikki. Well, we do, I suppose. We could do, we could do wild dog action, but we'll probably save that and try and see if we can just follow up and uh, the leopards and the wild dogs are in a similar area so maybe it's worth just checking those places and we'll get lucky with one or the other hmm James this is an interesting question you're wondering what grasses are most nutritious at the moment well a lot of the grasses haven't had their inflorescence yet which is probably the most nutritious part of them so that means that we have a situation where they're still eating a lot of the forbs that are starting to grow um, sort of some of the sort of herbaceous plants um, I would imagine red grass is starting to come through um, your, your natal red top those would be both quite nutritious and that they would start to eat now um, panicum is started I've seen one or two panic comes with a little bit of fluorescence so guinea grass also starting to come up and starting to grow and that's obviously a very nutritious one with those sweet nectar on the seeds that a lot of the animals will go for um, but really the grass is still very short and, and here is a prime example of it if you look off to my left or my right I'll go back a little bit maybe we can do it with the Franklins because that will be nice with them together so Ferg, let me just turn the car a little bit for you there we go but if you have a look where these franklins are and where they're walking around so they're just straight in front here look at the grass itself you can see that there is a little patch of green there but otherwise the grass is fairly brown and actually devoid of anything really looking green and so the nutrient level is not very high it still needs to grow quite a bit at the moment all those very very nutritious plants the tertiary grasses they need to still grow and come out a little bit more than what we've had already so it is starting to happen and we are starting to see a lot of them coming out but at the moment it seems as though sorry that's my head oopsie I almost got attacked by a crested franklin oh this one's getting a little excited a little head bobbing a little talking I think there's a little competitor around or a lady that he's trying to impress maybe it's a little display Oh, very nice stepping. I think Michael Flatley would be very impressed. For those of you who don't know who Michael Flatley is, is he was a what were river dance? Was it river dance? What was what what would you describe a tap dancer? Yes. And he used to move his feet all over the place as well. <laughs> So there we've got old Michael Flatley, the crested Franklin, as he bobs and weaves and displays and tries to impress the ladies or chase away the, the men. Very, very good. I'm very impressed. Well done.
Marco, are you wondering what are the trees that are currently budding with yellow flowers? Well, it is the weeping wattles that are busy budding with those bright yellow flowers at the moment. There might also be a few Mapani pomegranates in amongst them. Now, I'm actually looking around to try and see if I can find one that might have yellow buds, but at the moment, there doesn't seem to be one around me. I'll try and find you one, Marco, and see if we can show you these yellow budding, beautiful flowers. But you can see as Fergus pans away, just back to what we were talking about just now, just that the grass itself is not good at the moment. It's still barren. It's still quite dry. It's almost got that burnt effect after the last few days, so it's going to have to wait a little bit longer for the Thymidia and all of the others to start growing for these animals to be super excitable and really starting to get stuck into nutritious grasses. Right, let's go find this weeping wattle that we're talking about. I think there's one not too far from here. I'm just trying to rack the memory banks and just see if I can remember exactly where I last saw one. I think there is one flowering just down in Parlour Plains Road. Teresa, you're wondering if there are fruits in any other trees besides the marula. So yes, there is. I'm just looking to see if I can show you some. But on the guaris at the moment, there are fruits that have just started. There's also on the buffalo thorns, I've started to see some coming out. Uh, white berry bushes, they've started to sm show small little fruit. What else have I seen? Jacket plums, they're starting to come out. Uh, sour plums should be now soon, within the next couple of weeks. So lots of different trees actually that at the moment will start fruiting. We'll try and see if we can show you some of them. I'm looking on all the guaris here. None of them seem to have fruits. The guaris closer to the Mulawati seem to have a number of fruits on them. A lot more than what we're seeing on these guys up here. Although this one is starting. Here we go. Sorry Fergus, I'll go back quickly. So this worry here, you can just see on the corners of these little branches, if you go nice and tight in there, Fergus, you will see that there are small little green berries that are starting. So there we go. That's some of the guari fruit that is out and about and those will turn a little bit more and they'll start to become a darker coloration, almost a purple color and that's when you'll find that everything starts to eat them and they'll be eaten by us as humans, you can eat them, but it'll also be eaten by elephants, kudu, uh, nyala, you'll find impalas feeding off them. Um, I've even seen black rhinos, funnily enough, feeding off of these things. Um, what else? Pretty much anything that browses will, will go after these and, and feed off them. They're pretty tasty. So it's almost laden with fruit at the moment. And you'll find the birds also climb in to these quarries as well. So that's one of them that is fruiting. I can't see any of the others that could be fruiting in this area. They don't seem to be anywhere around. But how beautiful is that with a little droplet of water? Let's see if we can. Should we be patient and wait for the water droplet to drop, Fergus? Should we do a little, a little artistic water drop? That's maybe what we should do. There we go. It's getting heavier. It's starting to... Gravity is acting upon it. And there's two drops, not just one. So we're in for a treat here. We're not going to get just one drop. There's lots of action. Nikki, stand by for an action broadcast because this is all just too much for me right now. I'm no, just joking. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Of course, it's, it's still pretty though. It's nice to watch and, and you can see that the reflection of my light on it is absolutely blinding. Nikki doesn't think it's going to drop. What is? Let's have a bet, here. Fergus. What do you think? Ah, uh, my mind is on the bottom one in about half an hour. In half an hour? No ways, guys. I think in an hour from Nikki, you guys are mad. There's no ways that. Look at how much it's gone already. It's it's gravity is acting. I'm going to give it two minutes, and we're going to see the droplet drop. That's what I think. Especially with this little bit of wind that's just blowing, then there's a little bit of a breeze that is just r slowly rippling that little droplet. You see that little vibration is enough to cause some sort of droplet action here. Although maybe I'm wrong. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fergus is laughing at me. This is this is as exciting as it gets, everybody. This is why we're out here in the rain, is to watch droplets falling off quarry berries. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now Nikki is, is feeling desperate. Nikki, are you anxious that the droplet is not going to drop or that it is going to drop quicker than you thought? That's why I'm wondering. But we are probably going to leave. <laughs> Right, we're going to leave our berries and our water droplets. Well, I guess we'll never know. Nobody wants to indulge in my fun and see how long it takes for a droplet to fall off a dr sort of a, a quarry berry. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> if we, exactly. If we go this afternoon, we'll have paint drying. It's for everybody out there that wants to watch things that take a long time. <laughs> Nikki, why are you reprimanding me? I thought it was quite nice. I thought it was a good idea just to see how long a droplet would take to fall off a quarry berry. And you guys were ridiculous with your estimates. Uh, an hour for that would be too much, I'm sure. Come on. <laughs> we'll come here, exactly. We'll come at the end of drive and see if that particular berry has still got a water droplet on it. Anyway, let's carry on because we're delving into horrible things now well not horrible things but rather uneventful things according to my co-workers so let's try and go back and just show you the weeping wattle that i was talking about it doesn't have any yellow flowers anymore i'm afraid this particular weeping wattle it's somehow managed to drop all of its flowers in the last few days but there we go i think there's still some buds though are there a few little buds in there it looks like there might be but Let's have a look. No, just new leaves. No buds, unfortunately. But that's the weeping wattle. Yeah, there's some actually some yellow flowers. Are you going to be able to get that, Fergus? Slightly up above. Do you think not? Let's see. Let's try, Fergus. Come on. We maybe we can get this right. But look at those nice soft, velvety leaves. These are all very useful to go to the toilet with, which I, I know sounds very odd. But if you are desperate out here and you didn't have toilet paper, this is the plant to come and find. See, those leaves are nice and soft, and they are then can be twined together to make a beautiful toilet paper substitute which well since we are talking about droplets on things and all kinds of other things we might as well delve into Shakespeare. it's Shakespeare I know I'm, I'm a poet this morning aren't I this is poetry to hear me talk now I think Roof is in the way Fergus let's go back a little bit because you were almost there it was a it was a good pan Fergus I did enjoy your your or tilt sorry oh jeez I'm not winning this morning I'm just getting abuse from every direction from falling yesterday it just hasn't stopped it's been a 24 hour period of abuse but the little yellow flowers are right in the center of that wattles excuse the roof I'm, I do apologize little to the left little to the left there we go there the yellow flowers are well done Fergus so you can see them just inside there so Marco that's what you were asking about there are those little yellow flowers that will be also very nutritious a number of insects will be on those flowers so we have succeeded we have found a fruiting tree we have found a flowering tree now we need to find something with a, oh, a tree with spots in it how about that Fergus there we go with wild dogs underneath to satisfy your hunger for the dogs that would be a real treat the epic scene I agree let's do that because droplets of water are not as fun <laughs> now I believe Scotty has been sitting in FC and he's decided that my situation is dire and desperate and so he's going to head out in the Mahindra to give me a hand so that I don't have to talk about droplets of water falling off berries all after, all morning. Thank you very much Scotty D. Don't worry your turn will come as well where you'll be scrounging and, and maybe you'll also talk about the droplet of water. Who knows? It's 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 It can be a saviour when things are a little on the quiet side. Plus I feel like we have had an interesting morning. We, may not have seen very much but we've had good discussions Vegas. I feel like we've had a couple little chuckles and we've discussed some very important things Scarlett Johansson meeting James is is I would say probably number one on James's list of important things to do so what I reckon the odds are slim to none but well uh, you never know maybe I actually think it's up the onus is on us Fergus I think we as friends need to draft a letter and send it to her and just try and just also sell James Hendry a little bit more yesterday's article will go a long way so for those of you that missed it yesterday James was man crush Monday or was it the day before it was day before Monday. yeah it was on Monday James became the man crush Monday there was an article released about James Hendry on just how available he is and just what a, a catch a specimen like James Hendry is and so maybe if we send that to Scarlett she'll she'll gladly come along and come and see what all the fuss is about and why why there's these hashtags man crush Monday hot ranger I mean we can send that stuff and and really we'll get James maybe to meet Scarlett Johansson it's not beyond the realm of possibility eh? these things have happened and so you know what I think it's the onus is on us Fergus to to really try and and help James out we need to help a brother out as they say there goes a very nicely flowered weeping wattle careful there Ferg big bump <laughs> 
Oh, this is wonderful news. There is uh, two colleagues of mine that are going to come and save us from our droplets of water rather imminently. I don't know which one we're going to, but one of them is in a apparently fair-weathered Maasai Mara. Good morning everybody and welcome to a lovely morning that we're having up here in the Maasai Mara in Kenya as we watch these elephants move through the plains grazing on some grass. My name is Ralph Kirsten and we've got Archie on the camera, my right hand man and uh, yes we've just come down from the escarpment and found these elephants just moving through the grass here feeding nicely and it sounds like you've been uh, learning about all sorts of plants up uh, there in the Kruger National Park well these elephants seem to be feeding quite nicely on the red oat grass which is quite dominant in this uh, plains that we have here in the Maasai Mara and it's, it's a very good indication of soils or the area in very good condition so we're very happy to have this grass and so are the elephants because it is very nutritional and so they're having a lovely healthy breakfast now this morning I am planning to try and go and find Mr. Scar the famous lion male so we're gonna hit down towards the river after we've left this lovely little sighting and try and move into the area that Scar moves around that I have heard because I haven't seen him as yet and I'm sure lots of you would like to see him now please also don't forget to join us on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat please send your questions and your comments we'd love for you to get involved this morning wherever you are for us it's morning it might be afternoon or evening for you but um, I'm going to talk about the morning because that's what it is where I am right now. So I'm going to reverse up. These elephants are showing us their bottoms. So I think we'll do the same to them. And we'll head up along the road and down towards the river. Then whatever we might find in between while we're looking for Mr. Scar, I'm hoping for one or two leopards or black rhino. So we'll head with that aim to find Scar, but I think we might get lucky in between two. Now it is quite a cool morning, but it's, it's got that feeling that it's going to be very hot again this afternoon. Archie and I are going to stay out the whole day today once more, trying to discover the area. And uh, so I've piled on the sunscreen so that I don't get as sunburnt as I did the other day. But uh, while we start to head down towards the river, let's, uh, let's head over to Taylor, who uh, I think is um, ready to say good morning. We are ready to say good morning, but first we are watching a hot air balloon as it soars above the trees. Isn't that beautiful? And I'm sure you all wish that that was you sitting in the balloon basket floating above the Myra River. I know I wish it was me, but I've got the second best thing. I get to drive around in the vehicles and explore and see all these amazing animals and all the amazing sights too. And hopefully if the birds are playing along, we'll be able to listen to some really cool sounds. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Manu. It's Manu and Taylor every day. Remember this is live, this is interactive. You can hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can also talk to us via the YouTube chat. And well our plan for the day is shall we should, should we keep going? What do you think, Manu? One more Manu wants to have one more look. So our plan this morning is to race down this road and head back towards the Marsh Breakaway Pride to see if they managed to catch anything last night or perhaps they're going to utilize the early morning and the cool weather that's upon us and search for some warthogs that have yet to come out of their burrows. If I was a warthog, I don't think I would be out of my burrow just yet. Also, I need to correct Tristan. I mean, goodness, talk about a slacker. It's not Man Crush Monday today. It's Woman Crush Wednesday, Tristan, obviously. We all know who Tristan's woman crush is. Of course, that's Ali, uh, the Venezuelan bird. <laughs> uh, so, there we go. 
I know everybody's got hearts in their eyes and they see uh, and they see dear James Hendry. Who can blame you? But uh, it is Woman Crush Wednesday today, just by the way, everybody. If we're going to be uh, up with the trends, you know, you've got to do it properly. Shame Tristan tries, though. He tries to be so hip and cool. <laughs> Grandpa T. Right. So we're going to just keep heading down this way. I don't know, those lions could have moved the side. You could also see my two favorite lioness. They could pop up somewhere around here. But we'll keep an eye out for them. <laughs> I'm not repeating that. I'm not repeating that. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness, so this is one of the chillier mornings that we've, we've had out here uh, today in the Mara. Hey Manu, we don't normally have that. Manu's got his buff on up to his eyes. You can, you can literally just see his eyes this morning. Um, I've got the sniffles because it is so chilly. I feel like wearing my shorts today was maybe not a good idea, but then I know what the weather is like in the Mara. It starts off quite, it can start off quite chilly. And then by 8.30, my goodness, it's hot and um, you are taking the layers off relatively quickly. So I'll just have to bear the chills. Might have to get a blanket. Oh, I've got a sugar down here, which I shall wrap around myself at some point. Look at that. This is so cool. I love it when the hot air balloons go past. It just brings back the most fond memories and why not take a look when we can. Now just imagine being up there and I heard a giraffe or a group of elephants down below or even a pride of lions just staring up at the hot air balloon. Now first lady, you're wondering what fascinates me in the Mar? Well first lady, I, I've got the attention span of about a three year old. So everything fascinates me from this hot air balloon to the clouds to the birds that are also calling. And I want you all to have a little listen as to the sounds uh, that, well, that I'm hearing at the moment. So turn your volumes right up. Isn't that incredible? I'm going to make sure every single game drive we stop and we listen to sounds at some point. Look how low the balloon is going now. That's amazing! I can't believe it can go that low. Oh my goodness, are we going to watch it? What are they doing? Extreme sports in the hot air balloon. Skimming across. Literally, I reckon Manu, if we were to drive underneath it and you were to stand on the roof, you could probably give him a helping hand and push them back up. <laughs> <laughs> they were getting very, very close down to the ground. Some awesome maneuvers there. It honestly is the most amazing thing. And to, to really, you have to add it to, onto your bucket list. Obviously, coming to the Mara Triangle and doing it, it's the only place I've done a hot air balloon, but I've never seen such beautiful uh, scenery and so many animals before. Though I believe you can also go up in hot air balloon in Turkey where there's just hundreds and hundreds of them. I don't know if I'd like to see so many other balloons in the air. I quite like that it is sort of, sort of limited here in, in the Mara. There we go. Just going past the sun now. Oh wow. I believe you can just start to hear all the birds waking up. Should we have another little listen? I think so. I think all we need now is a hyena whoop, or a big roar from a lion. That would be a, the cherry on top this morning. But like we know out here, you can't have everything, unfortunately. And seeing a hot air balloon silhouetted across the sky and having the dawn chorus, I think, is a great way. There's even a hippo just below the hot air balloon that's out of the water. There we go. It's just going over it now. You can see the shininess. So that, that hippo has been out grazing for most of the evening and I, I don't think he lives quite down at the Mara River. He probably lives around the marshy areas. You can just see him now. Now, buttons, you're wondering if the animals are spooked by the hot air balloon. Some of them are. We went over lions and the lions didn't really care. They just looked straight up at us, which was incredible for photographs. And the elephant, we did see some elephants that weren't too fond of it. You know, 
I'm sure it must be quite daunting for these animals to have something coming from above. I mean, an elephant never really has to look up. And impala, to an extent, sometimes has to look up, especially if there are plenty of big eagles around. We know that they like to eat young impala lambs. The zebra didn't seem to enjoy it too much. But I suppose it also is just on the day. Some days they might be a little bit more relaxed than others. Other days uh, they will be a bit more skittish and, and tend to run away. The guys try not to get too close, though, to uh, the, uh, the animals. They typically stay above them as to not spook them the hippos didn't like them like it in the water they churned up the already muddy brown Mara River and and the crocodiles would swim away uh, but I don't think they'll ever get used to it I mean the hot air balloons have been going for I don't even know how many years and they all seem to still be a little bit nervous okay but now we better get on the move because we're gonna run out of this beautiful life in this beautiful cool morning and we could be missing lions hunting and it would just be nice to follow up of course on the story from yesterday watching that one lioness attempt and not catch anything ah now fern you've said that uh, you what well, you were asking if you could come to the mara and walk on the escarpment with me most Certainly. So the, the escarpment is not in the triangle. You can't do bushwalks in, uh, in the triangle, but you can get out of your car and stop and have a coffee and tea break and use the luxury facilities. They often have breakfast stops out here in the triangle, so you are allowed to do things like that out here. As long as you've obviously got your guide with you or an Ascari, we normally always have Ascaris with us, and then that allows us to do a lot more things uh, than the average person, uh, just because we've got, uh, well, security detail essentially. But up on the escarpment, it's all private land. So it hasn't got anything, you can see it just down there, there's the Olololo escarpment. So we have to go through a gate, a little boom gate, and then we enter the triangle and start our descent. So yeah, so we go exploring all the time. We go on bushwalks, uh, Angama Mara, they do bushwalks as well. Their guides take them uh, around through all the areas that we go safari parkouring. It's quite pretty. I haven't done one of those walks yet, but I really would, before I, before I leave, like to join on a uh, bushwalk with one of the Maasai guides and, and just learn a little bit more about what's actually going on, about the plants. Uh, I always talk about how I'm struggling to ID a lot of the plants out here because I don't have a book, you know, I don't have anything to help me with the leaf structure or the types of fruits that would put me in the right category of trees to start looking at, you know. So they, of course, have got this in-depth knowledge, just like all of us have got an in-depth knowledge of uh, the the, the plant or the vegetation in South Africa, we've got to build that up here. And sometimes the easiest way is to go with somebody that knows a lot about the area and then go from there. Hello, Jackalas. I wonder if this is one of our sub-adults. We're in the right spot. I'm just staring around. It does look like one of the youngsters that we have been seeing over the last two days, but I don't know where its friends are. Just sitting in the grass. Very nice. But we're not going to stay too long with this jackal because I do want to get up ahead and find these lions. We can always come back here or maybe we'll even meet the jackals up further. Perhaps they've befriended the lions now. This probably hasn't happened but it would be, it would be a nice story. It'd make a great Disney cartoon, wouldn't it? Okay, so we're going to keep heading along and hopefully we're going to find uh, the uh, big cats that roam around here in the Mara Triangle. But while I do that, Tristan is still bumbling about and hopefully he'll tell you about his woman crush Wednesday. Well, we'll get into all of that a little later, Taylor. We've, we've found an animal, a big animal, which is wonderful to see. We literally just bumped into it right now. So it's a beautiful young Ellie bull who has got some interesting coloration going on. He's almost as though he's gone full military spec camo. He's got bits of dust everywhere. So there's a bit of red. There's a bit of dark coloration from the rain. So he's looking quite dapper, actually. Yeah, he's, he's looking a little bit more spiffy than some of the other elephants in this area, particularly because he's come from a more clay type soil you can see there's that reddish sort of color around his face and his ears and there's a bit of dry patches there's a bit of dark patching he's done quite well i think i think he's uh, definitely been having a few tutorials on how to camo himself up of course, now I'm just talking absolute nonsense, but it is a beautiful specimen of an Ellie bull. I do apologize. There will be a poll that will come into the shot at some point. There is the poll. Thank you, Fergus. And so if it does come in again, I, I do apologize about that. But you'll see that he's going to kind of eat his way around and, and 
elephants must absolutely love this weather while it's not great for anything else and particularly not for us it's great for a big animal like themselves they don't get as hot that's for sure it's much cooler there's moisture which means it helps with their hydration and the vegetation all starts to grow and 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 spruce up like i was saying you'll find some leaves start to get a little bit more kind of moisture in them and so they can really just go about and feed off pretty much everything so an area like where we are now is the best place for an elephant to be there's all different types of vegetation there's bush willows terminalias grasses all kinds of buffalo thorns knob thorns it's a great area for a number of different um, animals well different vegetation types and therefore elephants will absolutely love it because they're able to get all the nutrients they need in order to survive but he has now firmly plonked his head in a bush which is not ideal because as you can see is the angle that he's at is not easy to kind of see him at all We'll talk about his tail, yes, you can see the tail is moving, Fergus, and, and that is because of flies, so unfortunately you'll find that flies do land a lot, particularly around the tail end of most animals, and so that is the massive fly swatter that that tail has, and also I suppose the tail is a good thing because it is a good indicator to us when an elephant is not happy. If you see that tail going straight out, there's two things that could be happening. One is there's about to be a giant exodus of vegetable matter out the rear end, or you're going to have a situation where that elephant is not very happy with you and that he's about to get very grumpy or scared. And so when they erect that tail, it's when they're nervous, scared, or upset. And so it's a good indicator of whether or not you should start moving away from that elephant and I suppose even if there are giant balls of dung coming out it's also probably a good idea to move away from them as well because nobody wants to be pooped on although I have seen a number of little calves being pooped on unfortunately which is not very nice <laughs> anyway while we contemplate what happens when you are pooped on by following an elephant let's go back across to Ralph and an animal that doesn't mind rolling in its poo at all we've just um, come along down the road towards the swamps that then lead into the river area and we're just following up behind a hyena here who's obviously on the last little bit of its evening patrol but we do generally find a few hyena in this area I think there's probably a den site somewhere nearby I know the other day Taylor had one nearby here that was chewing on a old buffalo skull trying to bite off the last little pieces of meat but uh, it's a lovely morning once more and uh, I know it's quite wet down there in the Kruger National Park here yeah, it's quite crisp this morning it's not wet but uh, we do have some clouds around so it's making for a little bit of a, a an iffy butty morning we don't know if it's going to be very hot or if it's going to stay quite cool um, the sun's just disappeared behind the clouds and so it's actually gone quite cold again now just over there we've got a lovely spurring goose in the marshes there and you can see that lovely backdrop of clouds making for a change in color it's always changing it was a lovely golden glow a minute ago and now it's we're fully in the shade and we can hear a lot of frogs calling there's also the white-faced whistling ducks doing their pew 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 but obviously being next to a big marsh like this uh, the amphibians really enjoy it. It does sound like olive toads that are squawking or croaking. And there's the white-faced whistling ducks. So a little bit of birding in the morning on our way through to trying to follow up on Mr. Scar. Now I did find out from Taylor, well I tried to find out which pride she thought that I had the day before yesterday with that elephant chasing that young male off or trying to get him off of that little warthog that they caught and she she seems to think that it might be part of the sausage tree pride but um, it's not confirmed that she was trying to also piece things together as was I so we're still on our way a little bit further along towards the river let's follow up behind this hyena and see what else we can find in between 
There is a vehicle behind us watching similar to what we were. And there's also quite a few woolly necked stalks, some egrets. Now Snazzy, you're wondering if I'm enjoying the vastness of the Mara. It, uh, it definitely is inspiring to be out in this wilderness area like this and the vastness is very enjoyable snazzy as we just coast in slowly here behind a defasa waterbuck a little bit different to our waterbuck that we have in the kruger national park it doesn't have that that white toilet seat ring on the bum and it is slightly darker as well now that would say to me that with it being darker the climate where you find this antelope predominantly would be a lot cooler because they're wanting to absorb more heat as opposed to our water buck which are a lot lighter and in hotter climate an area which they frequent so they're a lighter color reflecting the heat a lot to do with that thermoregulation and obviously if you're in a cooler environment you do want to be darker so that you absorb warmth colors do affect the temperature regulation and lovely grazing through all right so a lovely scene the frogs calling next to the marshland here and the water buck moving through we're still going to try and catch up a little bit with that hyena, one of my favorite animals in the world. Still walking along down the road, it's just gone off onto the side. And we leave the water buck to continue grazing. So up ahead here, this hyena is patrolling, probably sniffing around to see if it can pick up any little meat pieces now Fern you've put into words exactly what I th think quite regularly and hyena always seem to walk with a purpose now I'm just coasting in here a little bit because he was actually marking it's probably and I was hoping to see it do a full mark but it wasn't so Fern yes absolutely I agree with you they always look like they are moving with a purpose and uh, I always find it very funny because even if you're a hyena if you look like you have any weakness whether that be that you've got a thorn in your foot so you start to limp now wait watch what he's doing there you see he's actually that stepping over the grass and then walking along it like that that was probably utilizing its anal gland doing a little pasting and that's how hyenas mark their territory brown hyenas do it a lot more and, and they leave a lot bigger of a paste but spotted hyena also do it and civets as well but what I was saying was that even if you're a hyena, if you show any form of weakness within the hyenas, it's like they're sitting there. It's like they're sitting there ready to um, eat each other. So it's quite a dog eat dog sort of situation. So you cannot show any form of weakness. Now I did mention brown hyena, and we generally find those more in an, in the arid areas. We don't find them here. And they're very frequented on the west coast, uh, down into Namibia, and a little bit then from the south up the east coast, uh, eastern areas of South Africa. But uh, generally frequenting more arid zones. And they are solitary, they don't move together like the spotted hyena, will stay together. They're normally uh, a little bit more like a leopard, but a lot more hairy and they're also very nocturnal so very similar habits to that of the spotted hyena but they don't stay in big clans like 
this particular animal would. And they stay more in in ones and twos, and that's it. So that that small little family units, more so with the brown hyena. And what's quite special about them is that they they live quite an omnivorous diet. And in some places in Namibia, they can even survive on a vegetable diet when they don't come across any. Uh, uh, insect or animal protein, they can actually survive on eating melons, which they know where to find within the desert, and they live on this protein that they get from simply plants, which is quite incredible for a supposedly carnivore. But uh, they've adapted quite similar to that of the jackals. The jackals also feed a lot on fig trees and nyala trees, fruit. Uh, they also would sometimes dig up bulbs and roots and following in the footsteps of the of the warthog and the baboons. I think they follow them. I think that's probably evolved from them being around them and watching them feeding on, on these different um, vegetable protein. Okay, so I'm just floating in right up next to this hyena once more with the backdrop of the hot air balloon, the sky ships moving through there um, and while we do that soon I'm going to pass this hyena and head down towards the river but in the meantime let's go over to Taylor who is driving around We're driving around with a purpose though and I'm sorry I'm focusing because I'm scanning and also trying to not drive into the lugger this morning which is just on my left uh, we're looking for the cats that we had last night, the marsh breakaway. I haven't even seen one footprint of those lions. Now the roads where they were sitting on yesterday, they were quite sandy. And I don't understand how their tracks aren't around, because I saw them yesterday afternoon. This hippos and elephants have come through and have completely squashed them, I'm not sure. But I have to check very carefully along this very dense tree line because we know that there's one female that does have young cubs and, well, they could be here somewhere. So, we have to focus. I have to tell myself when I need to focus, otherwise then I get distracted. And I don't follow my, my goal or well, what I want to achieve for the morning. Let's check back in here. I don't know where they've gone. Whee! Now, Jeanette, you're wondering if there are any honey ba badgers in the Mara. There most certainly are. Uh, there definitely are honey badgers. I haven't seen any yet, though. We see their tracks every now and then. And maybe it's just because the grass is so long. It's perfect habitat for them, though. Check here. No tracks. I don't think these lions have come this way unless they've just marched across the grass. And of course that's what makes tracking so difficult in the Mara and why we don't really use that technique that we do in the Sabi Sat is because of all the grass. But there are certain roads that they have to cross that are quite sandy and that could help us out. So if we don't come right here, what we might do is do a quick check for the Ingamas, seeing as though we're very quickly approaching their territory. Checking. I could have just missed them as well. They could have just been laying in one of the luggers out of reach. It's also a possibility. Well, there's a zebra that I've been walking here. Zebra and buffalo. Okay, I've got lion tracks and cubs. That's good news. Okay, now we need to keep our eyes peeled. In fact, they were maybe following. Let me see if I can, I can't, I don't know if I can find a nice one. We'll have a very quick look. You see those tracks going there, Manu? I'm not going to get out the car now, though, because I know that these cats are somewhere around here. These tracks are pretty fresh. Uh, there you go, you can see one. Uh, and it looks like that pride that we were with last night. So they ha are here. So you can see that you, you can see tracks every now and then. Just when the sub substrate's okay. Now the grass is so long and there's so many spots that they could go into and we can't off-road here unfortunately which is no good for us so hopefully they just stick going in this direction where it opens up a little bit more
guarantee I'm not driving off the road because I'm trying to find these lions and not actually concentrating on where I'm driving. that bat fox den again. Uh, I did, I know exactly where it is, but I haven't been able to put the young kits on screen, unfortunately. The adults are very, very skittish. So, I they'll probably be quite old by now. I think we've missed our chance to see cute little fluffy young bat-eared foxes. But um, hopefully we'll find some more maybe next year. Sorry, I need to concentrate, otherwise I'm not going to find these lines. Cool, okay, we're going to keep searching for these lines. I'm going to send you back to my friend Tumbelina down in South Africa. I wonder if those wild dogs will make an appearance or perhaps a spotted cat. Well, MacMuddy, that is perfectly fine if you call me Tumbelina, given that we had a little tumble yesterday. And MacMuddy is because, well, Taylor McCurdy, not only did she fall in the face first into the mud, she also, apparently this morning, almost used her mud mask face wash story and almost brushed her teeth with it. So it seems as though she has a thing for mud at the moment, and hopefully she doesn't brush her teeth with mud because it's not going to look very pretty if she does. Also, I would imagine it won't taste very good either. Right. I'm going to head quickly towards Gauri Dam. Thank you to those that let us know that there are alarm calls. We also had a faint audio of them from when we were, from where we were. So, Marco Siberia Zoom, thank you very much. We also heard very faintly somewhere in the distance. So, we're going to try and work it out where it is. Hopefully, they're still alarm calling by the time we get there because we were a little far away. Now, Ellie Bull decided to carry on and move off into the thickets. He was a little shy, actually. He wasn't into the fame and, and the sort of camera, he just decided he'd face his bum to us and just keep it like that. So he's left behind and maybe we'll catch up with him a little later. Let's just try and get into this area. I believe the wild dogs cross north into Biffles Hook from Mvubu Road, somewhere that side. They apparently already crossed early last night, so they were on a serious mission in the late part of yesterday evening. And then Shadow was left not far from quarantine, so maybe this is her that's causing these alarm calls. I'm sorry, I've got something in my eye, so I'm just trying to work that out. There we go. I think that will work. So it seems as though she could be around. Obviously, we know Tundi is also around the area at the moment, so it could be either one of those. There was a big male leopard seen somewhere near Buffalzook Dam, Buffalzook Boundary, yesterday afternoon as well. So, you know, it could be Tingana maybe is around. It could be a number of different things, but worth going to go and check. I also found tracks for another Birmingham going out on Impala Plains, going to Simambili side. So, a lot going away from us, but nothing that I could see coming in. It's okay though, we'll find what we're looking for eventually. It's just going to be a sort of morning of checking and, and might have to work a little harder than we did yesterday, which is okay. Yesterday was one of those days where everything just seemed to happen for us, which is the best way to spend a day. So Shamsan, you're wondering with such a high density of leopards that I mentioned earlier, will they become a problem? Well, it's possible. Um, I think the, the problem lies not so much with the females, but with the males. That's where our biggest issues are going to be, Shamsan. Uh, you know, if we've got a whole bunch of males around, then you typically find that there's a few issues with that and, and that the males are going to end up fighting quite extensively and then cubs get killed and, and the sort of negative effect of the population is pretty big. So, you know, the, probably the, the density of males at the moment is not ideal. It's going to make it very difficult for a number of our females to actually be able to survive and to be able to get what they need or to keep their cubs alive and, and all of those kind of things. So, 
I think at the moment we are right in that uh, some of the males are still young. I, I suppose there's also a little bit of space for them if you think that Buffalo's hook at the moment really doesn't have too much in the way of big dominant male leopards that are around. I mean, Kajima's there, and obviously there's a new male that uh, there's another male that they've been seeing there that's got a big cut underneath his eye. So he's around, but I mean, they, it's a massive area. So I suppose there's space for for another male in that sort of section. They're and in the western side, Anderson seems to be so busy with all the females on Ottawa and Londolosi at the moment that he's kind of abandoned that central Arethusa section and Tingana doesn't seem to go there, so that's where that new male is kind of slotting in. And Hosanna and, and Tamba, well, they're not quite there yet. They're still too young to be really kind of focusing on on establishing themselves. I know Hosanna probably thinks he's 35, even though he's only not even two years old, but he, you know, he's still a little young. He needs to kind of probably grow up a little bit more before he's actually going to become dominant. So those two are still going to be able to live a little nomadic existence around here. But uh, yeah, so there is danger in that regard. And when you get high densities, there can be casualties and fatalities, and, you know, it becomes a lot harder to be able to raise um, any cubs or anything like that. Okay, so we're at the dam now. Maybe it's worth just turning off. Okay, so Marco, you say the guinea fowl were alarm calling on the northern part of the dam and you saw one scurrying across the open areas as it was going. So I'm just listening now and just stopping and looking. I just did come past one guinea fowl behind me that is very quiet and looking around and is on the ground, which is never a good sign when it comes to predator. Now, Marco, I wonder if you can help us with whether or not it was a only guinea fowls or if you heard some alarm calls of impar or what it might be because guinea fowls if they are alarm calling it, while it could be a predator for sure it could also be something like a Wahlberg's eagle or a Marshall eagle um, they will you know alarm call for those things too so I can hear a squirrel alarm calling as well but that's inside the camp there goes some noble ducks that are going to come into frame there they go uh, there we go so that's a female and male noble duck that are busy flying off southwards i don't know where they go but every time i see them they fly north south so it almost like goes from twin dams then they fly a straight line over gauri dam and northwards so i wonder what dam is north of us that they like to sit on and maybe they go southwards towards chitra dam or somewhere there to go and spend time. So there's our noble ducks. Nice to see them. Right. A squirrel is not really that loud. And it's not shouting enough for something to be in imminent danger. Maybe let's just check behind the damn wall. I don't see any tracks here either that would indicate a cat of some sort coming into this area. But you never know. Let's just double check. I also don't see any impalas or any of those kind of animals, so if it was just the guinea fowl, then it could be a tough one. Uh, like I said, it could just be an aerial predator, it could be uh, something like a slender mongoose, it could be a civet even, or a genet maybe that it's bumped into. There's a number of different things that, you know, guinea fowl will alarm call, but let's double check it and make 100% sure of what's going on. And yes, you're asking when do I think Hosanna will move into Tingana's territory? Well, he's already in Tingana's territory. He's living under the safety of Tingana at the moment. And whether or not he'll move into this territory is still debatable. He's a young male and he's not really out of the age where he can be territorially dominant just yet. So, you know, whether he actually becomes a dominant male here is still remains to be seen. Tingana's still got a lot of fights in him and certainly won't be just a push 
push over and we'll just give up for the sake of giving up. So, you know, Hosanna, as much as we want him to be dominant in these areas, I, I, whether or not he will be is completely debatable and is is not known to any of us. And so, you know, the, the reality is is that he could very well not be around in this area. He could be pushed out by Tingana and end up being a dominant male somewhere else. It's not necessarily going to mean that he's going to take over Tingana's territory. But in terms of if we'll move into Tingana's territory, he is in Tingana's territory already. He's living under his blanket and so is Tumba the both of them are and that's how they're able to survive if they were in someone's territory like Anderson they're going to have a very tough time of it because Anderson doesn't recognize them as his offspring and therefore will try and chase them away so they're going to have a very sort of hard time but I'm sitting here now still no sort of audio that I can get of anything it's worth just kind of when you're doing these things is just to go a little bit turn off go a little bit turn off and just try and work out what's going on i mean there very well could have been a leopard that had walked across somewhere particularly on the northern side maybe towards galago into the camp that's very possible we know tani does walk that route so does tingana so we can check around i'll go check a past galago pan and just see if anything is around that side we and we'll then keep turning off as we go to try and just see if there is any sign of whatever caused a bit of disturbance but while we do that let's go back across to ralph in the Masai mara and see how he's enjoying his time in the eastern plains and we have just stopped here briefly just to have a look at these taipi that we've seen on the side of the road they were just having a little bit of a jousting session and just off to the right of them as well there's another water buck that i've been just watching closely because she seems to have spotted something in the thickets and that one with the little youngsters is a little bit concerned so we're just having a quick inspection to see if there's not something interesting in the in the thickets now remember with waterbuck that wouldn't be two babies from the same mom waterbuck very often drop the, all the young in a nursery type uh, environment and sometimes you have some of the younger females looking after them so numerous females will uh, drop the young in this lovely group of baby waterbuck and then they all go off and graze and leave the nannies to look after them so this is a very small little group of them two of them only but you can very often find them in much bigger groups of all little youngsters of the same age like that and they're watching the topi who are still jousting a little bit in the early morning freshness you very often find the antelope full of energy and they do their stotting and pronking and uh, there's that female there that is just keeping an eye on the thicket in this in a very similar direction that's actually the reason I stopped here it's just because we need to always watch the animals they're the ones that give away the predators whereabouts when they're all focused on one particular area and I've many times I've found uh, predators because of that just watching impala waterbuck zebra or gi giraffe are a good one because they've got that elevated position if you see them all moving into one area and all start looking down on one spot it's generally for something sinister like a predator okay it doesn't seem like she has spotted anything I think like any mom with little youngsters she's just a bit paranoid and so you should be when you've got lots of predators wanting to eat your babies so you'd be scared just like she is now Philip you're wondering if waterbuck aloe suckle well, that is a very good question. I never even thought of that. Because of them dropping them inside that nursery, it is actually quite feasible. But I wouldn't be able to answer that with any conviction, Philip, because I need to actually go and look that up. That's a very good question, and that is going to be my homework for this morning. I'm going to go and find out where the water buck do aloe suckle. 
with them dropping them in that nursery like that, it would make complete sense um, because the the actual mother of the young would be away for for, for quite an amount of time. So it's quite feasible, but. Uh, I think we need to look that one up and I'm going to do that uh, between drives because Archie and I are out the whole day that gives me something nice to go and look up and I will have the answer by this afternoon's drive for you Philip if you are going to be around catch up with me on this afternoon I'll have that answer ready for you unless you have the answer ready for me by this afternoon so we're still heading down now towards the river. We've been flanking it a little bit just alongside the, the river Rhine and forest vegetation alongside the river. Looking for any signs of predators or anything interesting really. It's not only predators that we're after but they are first prize. Ooh, so while I move along the thickets looking for anything that's lurking inside, let's go over to Taylor, who I think has also found a lurker. Well, we've almost breaking my record for black rhino, so I just want to show you all of them quickly. There's three black rhino, and we'll have a closer look in a minute. Then there's one very far away down on the tree line. Can you see that one down there, just behind the topi? There's number four, and then there's five and six to the right of us. How cool is that? So many black rhino together. I've, the most I've ever seen together is seven, but they were all standing quite close to one another. There were lions around, but this is amazing. I don't think I've seen so many before. Manu, we can go up a little bit closer. What do you think? I just quickly stopped because I wanted to show you. I'm going to go up a little bit closer. I want to just see how they react. Of course, they've stopped. But let's just edge on along. That's amazing. It looks like maybe a, a mom and calf behind us. I don't know what the sexes are up ahead of these rhino. I would assume the one far away that was down by his, uh, on its own would be a male. But it's quite difficult to tell. I just want to get up a little bit closer. That's incredible. The last time I was lucky, we had four rhinos together and I thought that was pretty special. This takes it to a whole nother level. Seeing six rhino within just a few hundred meters of each other. They don't seem too bad actually. One's a little bit agitated, but it looks like it's relaxing its tail now. There we go. Now they've settled down again. And they're not bothered by us at all. Let's quickly see who's who. Uh, if who's male and female. I think this is a male. We've seen that rhino before with the very tattered ears. That looked like a female walking behind that one on the left. Let's see what that one is. That's another female. So there's two girls there. And I'm pretty sure that one with the tattered ears, which we'll see now, is going to turn. We'll be able to identify. Yeah, that's a male. So how great is that? So two females, and those are fully grown cows as well. They don't look to be uh, very young. And he's a very, very lucky fella to have uh, so many females around. So there we go. For those of you uh, that always saw black rhino were on their own and typically they are male and female do mark and defend territories but I think they're a lot more social than what we actually realize and uh Mr. David Attenborough, I think it was David Attenborough, he had, the, I can't remember which documentary it was, and he, sh I think it was in Namibia where there was, I can't even tell you how many rhinos around a watering hole. Now that would be quite common to have, say, f 10 or 11 black rhino around a watering hole. Obviously it's a common source, everybody has to share it, you can't just own that watering hole. Uh, but out in the open, I mean, there's no real reason uh, for them to be together, so just goes to show. Also those houses, that's just the staff accommodation uh, for the people that work at the Olololo gate. That's amazing. <laughs> now Evelyn, you've said, wait, is this actually live? Yeah, yes it is. This is happening right now in the Masai, well not in the Masai Mara National Reserve. That's on the other side of the Mara River. We are in the Mara Triangle and it is 7.32 Eastern African time. 
pretty cool eh? that we get to see this. There's the other rhino with a car. I'm pretty sure that's a calf. It just looks much smaller. And also a tailing right next to mom. But we'll have to see when they, yeah, that looks like a cow. And the young sub-adult. Very nice, a little topi in the background too. There must have been in the annual meeting. Perhaps it was the Christmas function for the black rhino in the Mara Triangle last night. And uh, they're all just heading home. Oh, she looked like she stumbled. I wonder what, uh, what rhinos prefer to drink. And where's our other friend? He's disappeared. Oh, no, there he is. He's still there. Just moving very slowly. Now, Octo, you're wondering what is the anatomy of a rhino's foot? Mm, well, they've got three toes, so they're odd-toed ungulates. Uh, I wish you could see a track on the floor a little bit better, because unfortunately I don't think a rhino is going to willingly lift its foot up for me. Um, but they've got an interesting design. We'll have to try and find you a rhino track. The best place to see rhino tracks are actually in the sabi sand, because it is so sandy then you can have a look. I have seen rhinos up close, and I've touched rhinos just from dark and colouring and taking blood samples and notching ears on the various reserves that I've worked on. There was even one rhino that was uh, one male white rhino that got into a fight with another fella and unfortunately his horn pierced the, the sheath of his penis which was a, obviously a problem and because rhinos are of course an endangered species the Sabi sand Voltaine made the a decision to jump in and help and anyways and they went and they cut away the dead tissue because it became horribly infected and they ended up saving that rhino's life so that was the last time that I got to interact up close with a, a big male white rhino I've also, I've also um, touched black rhino before and seen their feet and looked at their lips down in the Eastern Cape. That was many, many years ago, though, uh, where we also, again, we collared the, the black rhino, put ankle collars around them. And that was incredible to see as well being a part of that entire process. Wow, what a great start to the morning. But we are going to keep searching for our lions. The rhinos are walking in the direction that where we're going to go and look for the lions. So hopefully, uh, well, we'll see an interaction between those two species. How exciting would that be? But Tristan is still on a bumble this morning in the Sabi sand. The miserable weather is keeping the animals at bay. Who knows, maybe the sun will break through the clouds. Well, exactly, Taylor. It's been a, it is a miserable start to the day, and well, we haven't had much luck, but that's okay. I feel like our luck will change if we have a good, positive attitude. Something, somewhere is going to come out and surprise us, and we'll get lucky and be able to see some sort of sign of a cat somewhere in the area. But I am very jealous of Taylor McCurdy and her rhino sighting it's, it's always very special to see a black rhino but to see six of them is just ridiculous so she is very fortunate and hopefully there will be a bit of interaction it's it's fun to watch the bl black rhinos with lions they get quite upset about it and chase them around all over the place it's it's pretty funny to watch the poor lions get abused a little bit but i suppose they do go after black rhinos from time to time as well and so it's rightly so that they get chased a bit i remember actually watching a sighting in, in a certain reserve where lions were on the back of a black rhino and, and chasing black rhinos around and jumping on it and then eventually the black rhinos taught those lions a very valuable lesson as to why not to be on the back of them and one of the lions got thrown a little bit so best not to to mess with them so I hope that Taylor will see something really cool out of that sighting but like I say very jealous while I drive around in the rain that she's sitting with those six in the beautiful sunshine Oh well, one day, I suppose, we will get lucky enough to go up that side of the world. Right, now, because we haven't had any luck here on Juma, I checked around for those alarm calls, we did a loop around, check for tracks, no tracks, no more further alarm calls, or no sort of sign of anything, so I don't really know if there's anything around there. It's also such a close proximity to where Tandy could have just slipped in and gone into the drainage line towards the den, and there is somebody else that's going to go check there, that I feel like it's better that I just carry on and try and see what else I can find. So I'm going to head towards Chitwa, I haven't been to Chitwa in quite a number of days now so I want to head that way maybe we get lucky with Hosanna somewhere on that side of the world I'm secretly hoping that we'll get lucky with somebody like T uh, Tumba because I haven't seen Tumba for so long and I've missed that little cat so I'm gonna try and see if I can go and 
sneak one of those two little rabbits out of a hat. Also a good area these days for quarantine. Seems to be spending more time on Chippo, which is which is good news. So that's where I'm going to head. I'm just going to see and, and try and see what I can get. And maybe I'll get lucky and we'll see something interesting. Otherwise, the dam was always a nice place to go. The weather is not great for the dam, but you never know. Maybe some interesting birds have blown in on this front. It was very windy yesterday afternoon and last night, and that often means that we get some interesting birds that will kind of blow through so it's worth going and checking worth having a little look around just seeing if maybe we get lucky with a interesting bird of some sort hold on Fergus this is going to be a bit bumpy down here I do apologize so this little section has become a little on the bumpy side and I have to remind Fergus and myself these days to hold on and not fall out. There we go, we're down. Roxy, you're wondering about the Sticks Pride, any news on them? They went into Mala Mala yesterday, haven't heard anything of them coming back today. I know that one of the Birmingham's apparently also crossed south in the same sort of direction that the Sticks went yesterday, crossed south there this morning early, so... I suppose they're still down that side, I, I would imagine. I'm not 100% sure though, but they were the last tracks we were crossing out of Cheetah Plains and into Mala Mala. And in Kuma Pride, still no real sign of them and any kind of visibility. Oh, hello, elephants. Good weather for elephants actually this morning. Rainy and overcast is always wonderful for a bit of Ellie interaction. Now, they're spread out a little bit on the right hand side here. There's not really easy view at the moment, but I'm hoping they are going to start coming out a little bit. You can see there's some of the little ones with the adults, and they're all just sort of stationary feeding and, and moving in slowly in a southerly direction. So. Now, I do apologize about the wiping of the lens. I know there is an elephant, but Fergus is just trying to clean everything up after us driving because there's a bit of rain on spots and, and it causes, obviously, everything to go a bit blurry. So, just a little wipe quickly. Right. Now, Ellie's are moving southwards a little bit and it opens up quite, a ni quite nicely. So, I just want to go forward just a little bit just to try and see... Oh, there we go. There's one on the road. Where are you running to? Huh. This is on the racetrack, this little circuit that's being run this morning. Good morning. So just a little sniff around. It's interesting, it kind of went south and then just came around and came back up towards the road. So I don't know if maybe one of the other ones was giving a little chase. I don't see any other... Oh, there we go, there's another one of the adults coming out behind it. So that's why. I think there's a little game going on between these two young bulls. I think they're chasing each other around. Oh, actually, she might. I wonder if that front one wasn't a female. I just, it just didn't really look nicely, but I saw kind of a bull coming up from behind. This one is definitely a bull. I think it was actually a female that was in front. Yes, it is a female. So maybe she's coming into an Easter cycle, and that's why this bull is sort of chasing her around and why she's moving so quickly. You can see wherever she goes, this young male is following. Now, he's a little on the small side. I would be very surprised if he got to mate. I suppose it can happen, but I would imagine that we'll see slightly, slightly larger bulls coming in if there is a sign that she's in estrus. So the bigger bulls will pick that up and they'll start arriving and they'll push the smaller male away. But if they don't, then I suppose it's very possible that he could mate. He is sexually mature in that he can have or can produce sperm and, and can produce can fertilize an egg so even though he's younger and smaller and it's not ideal that female will try not mate with him i suppose if the push comes to shove and there's no others around then she she might just do so all right let's just go forward a little like i say it seems to be a little bit more open a bit more open on this side hang on a second sorry i just spotted something that i thought i saw has that elephant got different colored eyes, Fergus? Not the one that's running away now, the one that's just standing still. No, it doesn't. I thought it might have had some light color in the eyes, but it might just be a bit of secretion. They sometimes do get a bit of secretion from the eye itself. Let's see if she turns, if the eye color is slightly lighter. But there is a little light spot. No, the eyes are normal. But there was a light spot there. It just caught my eye a little bit, so that's why I was double-checking and, and having a little look. 
But it is absolutely wonderful to be in amongst the Ellies. It's such a nice thing to be sitting with them. I know the weather is not great, but for elephants, this is the best weather. And it really is great to be in a herd. They are, provide the most amazing sort of feeling when you're in amongst Ellies and they're all feeding around you just to listen to the noises of them going about their business and to kind of just have that atmosphere of these massive animals that are completely relaxed and all around you is a very, very special thing. So I would like to know from you guys what you think you would feel if you were in amongst the Ellies this morning. So you can just hashtag for it. I want, let's do a one-word tweet as to how you would feel if you were, had the opportunity to try and sit in amongst the Ellies and just watch them go about their business this morning and don't even have to say anything or be spoken to or anything like that just to sit and enjoy the beauty that is a herd of elephants around your vehicle. Oh, Philip, uh, this is an interesting question. You're wondering how far away can a bull elephant detect a female elephant in estrus? Well, I would imagine it would it would take him kind of coming across the scent of the urine. Um, so that would be by random. And then from there, pretty good. He would just follow the scent of, of her as she's walked along, follow her footprints and those kind of things. So I would imagine far is probably the answer to this. Uh, easily a couple miles, maybe more, I would, I mean, it's, I actually don't know the exact number, but I, I would imagine it would be a long, 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 long way, as long as it can come up across the scent of the urine, and there's still some scent left there, which, you know, obviously depends on environmental conditions and whether there's rain or not, but I would imagine that these guys could probably pick each other up from maybe even bigger than 50 kilometers, or maybe 20 miles, it would be interesting to know, I would love to actually know the answer, maybe somebody does have an answer for us and can let us know, as as to how far it is that the bulls can pick up an estrus female before following and eventually finding her. I know that they do follow the tracks a lot and they'll follow scent a lot as they go. Right, now I believe some of you have already sent one word tweets through. Josh, you say fantabulous? I think that's a nice way to put it, actually. It, would be, it is fantastic or fantabulous to be in amongst the great giants of Africa. <laughs> So, sorry, Nikki, if you can just repeat that, I didn't hear nicely. So, Octa, you say ventastic. Well, yeah, it always, always, anything tastic is to do with zentastic. Ah, there we go. I was wondering about that a little bit, but zentastic, yes, it is. It, you do feel very relaxed around the Ellie's. Well, I do anyway. It's it's a weird feeling when you're in amongst them. They say that there is a link to them and dolphins being very similar in that they secrete, well, they, they the sound that they produce and the waves that they produce help us to kind of relax and to enjoy and to be euphoric in their presence so much like they use dolphins to treat you know kids that have sometimes have some issues and learning problems and those type of things that you know sitting with dolphins helps those kids it's the same thing with ellies is that they produce a very similar sound and it's very good for um you know for one's well them. So Zen is actually a very, very cool, well, Zentastic is a very cool word to sort of describe these guys. Now you can see that this, uh, this female's got a tusk that grows off to the side. So it's quite interesting to see that there are a number of elephants in this area at the moment that all have very unique tusks. So we've obviously got Fang, who I still haven't seen, which bugs me a little bit, but hopefully I will find her in the next few weeks. I know she passed through and a number of the guides got to see her, so I would really like to, to find her at some point again and just catch up. But there's Mini Fang as well. which has got almost the two tusks split. Then we've got this individual that's got this tusk, weird kind of shape that they have. So a lot of different tusk designs in the herds around Juma in the last couple of weeks, which is very interesting. Now that particular tusk there, I think, is one that maybe got dislodged when she was a little bit younger and pushed out slightly, and that's why it's kind of growing in that direction. I don't think it's a it's the same as what we see with Fang's tusk, which is almost that Fang's tusk is from sort of the start of it growing. It's been in that direction and kind of growing towards her body, whereas this one almost looks as though it was normal at one point and it's just somehow being pushed out slightly. Maybe when it was leveraging a or some bark or roots or something like that. 
Julie, you say awestruck? Well, I would think so. I mean, it's, it, it is something about being in here. It's, I know it looks as though it's passive. I know it looks as though these animals kind of are drifting through the thing. Tickets and there's not really a great view, but I promise you, when they just kind of are, you you become in awe of the, not only the size but the the sort of nimbleness of these trunks and the way that they go about things and the little social interactions. They're an animal that's also massive, so when they're standing above you, you really are in awe of their size and and just their sheer bulk that they have. So it's a very special thing to be in amongst a herd of elephants like this. I absolutely love it. It's my one of my favorite things to do is just to sit for long periods of time with them and, and sometimes just to sit quietly is it's also very nice. At the moment they're a little far off for us to be sitting too quiet because you won't hear a lot of what's going on. It's only when they're a bit closer that you can actually hear the breaking of the branches and them moving around and walking and you know sometimes the little groans and grumbles that they let out. It's It's the most epic thing to be a part of. Now look at that female as she walks. It's quite difficult but look at her trunk. Her trunk is all white. It's almost got that kind of dead man's finger because of all the moisture in the grass and they've been feeding with their uh, sorry it's a bull actually um, feeding with their trunk down in the grass and so it's caused the trunk to get very wet and so it goes an almost opaque whitish kind of color much like our fingers wrinkle. It's the same thing with the Ellie's trunk. It's very cool actually to see sometimes. Mac, you're asking if we've seen the short trunk Ellie lately. I haven't personally, but Fergus and James saw it on Friday last week. So that's not too long ago. So she is around and is moving about, and I'm sure we'll catch up with her on drive at some point soon. Let's go forward a bit more, Fergus, because the rest of them are coming out into the open. Right, so Lara, Moore, you say you would feel honoured to be in the presence of these guys, and I think that probably sums up perfectly what it is like to be in amongst these animals. As these elephants, unfortunately, are persecuted through many parts of the world, their numbers have declined, and so to be in amongst a big grouping is an, is an experience that we can all relate to and, and feel honoured by being a part of that, that they are that relaxed to allow us in amongst them. Right, well, I think we'll probably sit with our herd a little bit longer as they move along. But while we do that, let's go back across to Rolf in the Mara and see what he's managed to find over the last little bit. few animals that I love to be around, elephants being one of them. But hippos, I love to be around hippos when I'm not in the water. They are a very special kind of animal in that sense that for me... If I'm not in the water, I absolutely love being in their presence. But if I'm in a little boat, I am quite concerned. It's, it's one of those feelings, it's almost like a permanent sinking feeling when you know that there's hippos around and you're on a little boat. You need to keep your eyes peeled and watch for any sign of them because it can be quite scary if there are any around and you just respect the rules then of the uh, safe zone, don't go between them and their deeper water and their safe area and you'll be fine, but you do need to be aware of this constantly. Now these guys are in the Mara River, in a lovely tranquil scene here, we did see one out grazing just before we got here and that tells us that it is quite cool, it's not just me being a wuss. I am a little bit chilly this morning with these clouds being around, the sun staying behind them and the breeze coming through. It's been nice and cool, not too hot just yet. Now another animal that I'm also quite scared of being around is crocodiles. They are very scary in the water and mostly because you can't see where they are. I prefer hippos because crocodiles, if you know there's crocodiles in the river, that's fine, but you don't generally know where they actually are because that view that you have now is a big view of a crocodile in the water. Very often you just see the two little nostrils poking out, if you see them at all. So, yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather be around hippos than crocodiles in the water.
But nice to watch them here from the safety of the Land Rover. And some of them have come to the bank to do a bit of sunning and warm up. It's quite similar to that of the hippos. They're also feeling the temperature this morning. That one just come out onto the bank recently to warm up and get some energy. Maybe then go back in the river, open his mouth and do a bit of fishing. But uh, I'm also very jealous of Taylor's black rhino. I have been looking for them for the last few days. It seems she's found them now. Sucker, now you're wondering if I've ever been close to an attack. Um, I'm assuming, well, it's probably because I've been talking about both of these animals now, crocodile or hippo. Yes, indeed, I've been very close to both of them uh, because I've spent a lot of time on boats um, in areas where there are hippos and crocodiles. And uh, one such time was on the little streams between the lakes in Cozy Bay. And uh, that was quite a scary situation because these little streams that connect the lake system, uh, they, they, they're very narrow and you're not allowed to go very fast. Now, in the area of Cozy Bay, it's right up on the northeastern border uh, of Mozambique, between Mozambique and South Africa, and it's a beautiful area. And they have hippos and crocodiles there. And while you're going through these little channels between the lakes, you need to go very slowly, but there is the possibility that there's hippos there too and one evening we went out fishing and we came back still in the darkness hours and we were going through one of these little channels and as we were driving along we saw some bubbles in front of us and when we realized what it was it was right next to us as these hippo came up to take a breath of air and at that moment the back end of the of the boat was sort of um, coming in line with the hippo and there was a big bull with a cow and a calf and when the bull realized what we were and he was at the the sort of line of the engine he launched himself out of the water nearly coming into the back of the boat and luckily my uncle uh, was watching while we went past and he floored it at that moment luckily nobody fell out of the boat because if they did it would have been tickets but uh, we managed to get away uh, the the bull um, Hippo was literally almost in the back of the boat though, so very scary situation that we had, um, but everybody got away safe and sound. But it's very important to remember where you are in Africa, and if there are hippos around, you do need to be extremely cautious. Right, I think we're going to carry on a little bit. Ooh. Hang on, maybe let's just have a look here, Archie, because it seems these hippo potentially come out of the water, or maybe not. They're just repositioning. They're all in a line now. Now, Sankit and Clivel, you're wondering if crocodiles ever have problems with hippos or uh, a question around that well uh, yes there can be some interaction between them but I think because they they live together in, a, in the same habitat all the time they do understand each other and the question actually be if they attack them well I've seen I've, I've seen hippos attacking crocodiles but I've never seen crocodiles attacking hippos. Now I've seen, and, and when I say hippos attacking crocodiles, it's mostly around um, food. And I do get the impression that it's quite similar to what we saw with the elephant chasing the lions um, one, when they started to chase uh, the warthog. I don't know if it's that they don't like predators in their vicinity because it's a natural sort of reaction uh, towards wanting to chase them away. But as soon as, as, soon as there's that 
that real hunt feel to it. You, you do see the, the hippos being a little bit aggressive towards the crocodiles. And I'm not sure if you would have witnessed it around the migrations as well. Once the crocodiles latch onto something and there's that sort of life and death struggle, you can very often see hippos getting involved and almost trying to push the, the, the crocodile off um, that sort of killing environment or killing zone. Uh, that's when I've seen them getting a little bit anxious around crocodiles but other than that it, it generally seems like the crocodiles understand that the hippos are bigger than them and stronger than them and would make a big problem for them uh, similar to that with elephants all right i think i'm going to move along a little bit and leave these hippos in a line um, but in the meantime let's go over to taylor who i'm not quite sure what she has but i'm sure she would have something lovely to show you